14 photos of yourself and we can identify who you are. You think you don't have 14 photos of yourself on the internet? And then he was asked, what should people do about their privacy? And he says, well, everyone should have a chance to change their name once in their life. The guy's up front, you gotta give him credit. Remember, these guys have this information. Now, I wanna tell you, this is being made available only to hope, only to hope. There is a way to completely get rid of all of the Google data out there. This is a short instructional film. I want you to watch this while I go back there and see if the hope has like committed fratricide on my people. your privacy while using Google? The internet giant says it understands. Google is now offering users a chance to opt out and live in privacy in a remote mountain village. Tech Trends reporter Jeff Tate has more. Thanks, Teresa. They call it the opt out village, and it's just what you'd expect from Google. If you want to keep your information private, all you have to do is move to our 22 acre opt out village and not speak to anyone from the outside world. It's very simple. Just go to the Google front page, click the opt out button, and in minutes, a van will come to your house and pick you up. That same day, a team of Google privacy experts eliminates your home address, guaranteeing it will no longer appear on Google local pages. And after just two days in the back of a van, you're there. In the village, we can guarantee that there's no chance of Google reading your emails because there are no computers. And because they're also monitored and tracked by Google, there are no banks or hospitals. Residents will be expected to know how to grow food, suture wounds, and bury corpses by hand if they plan to opt out. And Google has gone the extra mile to ensure that users who choose to opt out are given complete privacy in their new home. A 30-foot tall, 10-foot thick physical data security wall keeps all former Google users from leaving the village until they decide they want to start using Google again. The opt-out village can't even be seen by Google satellites because the entire town is enclosed with a large metal box with no openings. Google says those wishing to opt back into using Google after their time in the village will be allowed to do so if they agree to be branded with a whimsical G on their foreheads to label them doubters. If you don't want to give us complete access to your most private thoughts and feelings, that's fine. Uh, you can just toil in the hinterlands and die young. And Carter says the opt-out village is already getting rave reviews. One of the first village residents sent this letter praising the total privacy inside the village, saying, all alone, no light, hard to breathe. Now that's one man whose data is secure. For the Onion News Network, I'm Jeff Tate. Thanks, Jeff. If you have any... Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I look... Hello. What did I do? Um, besides the fact that I'm now going blind, how do we do something about this? Okay, whoever raised the lights, lower them. The magic word is now. Yeah. Well, all right, that's honestly, I, I damn near need them. Yeah, I'm not taking glasses from you, pal. You know, Part, part of it, part of it is, no, 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 I'm, I'm cool, I'm going to stand out of the light, but seriously, whoever is in charge of the light, it really is not making me happy. Um, well, this sucks, okay. Uh, I will talk. Uh, maybe. Um, the problem is, people think if you don't put stuff on the web, it didn't happen. Now, I remember hearing about Hitler killing himself in the bunker and his body being set on fire and all of these various things. Nothing happens in the world without it being on TV, without it being filmed. That, of course, is... Uh, Muammar Gaddafi getting his long overdue just desserts. Everything, everything is on the internet. Flickr. Flickr has a gazillion, now by the way, Flickr is today only a tiny percentage of Facebook, but it has billions of photos with things. Here's a woman, her and her inbred family went around robbing banks in the South. That's her two half brothers, you know, Daryl and her other brother, Daryl. And she posts, I'm 28, but like to act like I'm 17 most of the time. I love to farm and shoot guys, which she did. 
and wreck cars. I'm a redneck and proud of it. I like milk and German engineering and causing mayhem with my siblings. She went out and robbed banks with these guys, put this up there, put up her photos. As you might imagine, somebody said, hmm, that picture looks familiar, and she's locked up now. People put everything up there. LinkedIn, LinkedIn, you put your whole life story up there. Unbelievable for investigations, unbelievable for hacking, unbelievable for spear phishing. And I'm going through the various sites very quickly. Oh, for those of you who believe in passwords, which I hope at a hacker conference there will not be a single person who doesn't already understand that once you put that information out there, it's gone, it's everywhere, it's disseminated, it's spread, it's stolen, it's investigated, it's sold. There's no such thing as a secure website, zero. If it's on the net and there's a net connection, it's gone. You have given up control of that information and it will get out. Your credit cards will be stolen. Your social security number will be disseminated. Your job history, your employment, everything will get out. Not today, maybe next year. Um, you know, I understand that there were some people talking earlier about uh, security of medical record systems. I have here with me today some people who are actually experts on this. They run security at two of the major hospitals in, uh, in New York. And I've got to tell you, way worse, way worse, constant attacks. These people are fighting like, like lions to keep your, your information safe, and it's a, and it's a close fight, a close fight. I went to a guy's house. I was hired because a company was being extorted, a big software company. And they said, we're being extorted. Somebody sent us an email saying they have our source code, sent us a big chunk of our source code so we believe it to be true. And they said, if you don't give us $100,000 in cash, blah, 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 the whole ransom drop, we're going to release your source code onto the net. I tracked the threatener to a 14-year-old kid, by the way, uh, in, in Southern California and went to his house and was given consent by his father as he was kicking him in the ass to take all of his hard drives and his computers and signed it away. And on one of his computers, just one of his computers, just one of the files, I found 53,000 pages of MySpace logins and passwords. Not 53,000 passwords, 53,000 pages of logins and passwords, more than a million. Uh, just this one page, just this one data file, and you can see some of them down there, just this one data file, I did a print command just to see how many pages it was, 8,119 pages of MySpace logins and passwords. You know that there are gazillions of Facebook passwords floating around. Somebody just hoovered up 450,000 Yahoo passwords. Yahoo sucks, but, and you guys probably don't use it. But nevertheless, 450,000 passwords, I think, yesterday. Um, no such thing as a secure password. So you say, I don't care. I don't give them my real name. I use Tor. I do this. I do that. Honest to God, meaningless. Meaningless. I am not going to give you a master's class on de-anonymization. I am going to tell you it's done. It's done better and better and better all the time. This is to the benefit of selling stuff. This is not to sell you stuff. This is a service that is being developed for governmental and law enforcement agencies, kidnappers, threateners, hackers, harassers. And I don't mean good hackers. I mean the type that everybody else thinks are hackers, uh, terrorists. De-anonymization is a big deal, and the technology is getting better and better and better and better all the time. And I can tell you that these are some big data points. De-anonymizing Netflix posts. 87% of public census data de-anonymized. Carnegie Mellon researchers accurately guessed SSNs. The more data that I have, the more finely defined I can make an anonymous persona on the, on the internet, the more likely I'm going, to I, I'm going to identify you. If I know that this anonymous person is six foot eight, Chinese, a tap dancer, and lives in Iowa, it's probably one guy. Um, but I got to tell you, it's pretty close. The, 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 the public census data was just with a first name and a zip code. 
In a lot of places, if I put in Dolores in a zip code, there ain't that many. I own a system where you can search for somebody with just a first name and a zip code or a first name and a date of birth. If I have your name, your year of birth, and your zip code, I own you. I own you. That's enough. This is Dolores. She's 43, and she lives on Smith Street. It's enough. I know you're, from that moment, I know everything about you within an hour. It's enough. De-anonymization is not that hard anymore. Here's a perfect example. And I use this all the time. And now I've got to really, really speed up, by the way. Congress subpoenaed all the search engines because they wanted to see what they really know about you. Uh, AOL, to their credit, even though they suck at everything else, said to Congress, we are going to anonymize all of our searchers. We're going to give them code numbers. We'll give you their search history, but we will, we will take out their names and addresses and things like that. Now, the minute this was turned over to Congress, it became public record, stupidly. And the New York Times, God bless their pinko little hearts, took the AOL file and put a couple of researchers on it, and their researchers are terrific, and they took a random thing, and they found here is searcher number 4417749, which they were able to resolve to Miss Thelma Arnold. Her search history included 60-year-old single men, landscapers in Lyburn, Georgia, Shadow Lake subdivision, Arnold, and dog that urinates on everything. That was her search history. So they went, and sure enough, they found, oh, who was going to search for a 60-year-old single man? A 60-year-old single woman. Arnold? Arnold. Shadow Lake subdivision in Lyburn, Georgia, and owns a dog. Only one person. Mrs. Arnold, who lives in the Shadow Lake subdivision in Lyburn, Georgia. She's in her 60s, and she has a dog that urinates on everything. <laughs> Not hard to figure that out. You are your search history, folks. Start building those tinfoil hats. It's going to get worse. Algorithm can guess your SSN. Browser fingerprinting. Everybody's browser is remarkably unique. I know you're logging in from a Mac. I know you're running 10.6. I know this is the font set that you have installed on your system. I know that you are, uh, that you have these plugins. Uh, I know that you have previously done X, Y, and Z. Your browser has a reasonably damn good fingerprint. And by the way, if I can suck down your history and your bookmarks file, of course I own you. But even without that, your browser fingerprint is so unique that if you use that browser, to do kitty porn, and I come later and I grab your computer, I can say, even if you've overwritten 97 times with random characters or your kitty porn, I know that that's your browser. And I can prove it to the satisfaction of a jury. Browser fingerprinting. Dozens of, of, of uh, scholarly papers go to abstract sites, download this stuff, read it, and be freaked. Now, I'm not freaked. I use this in my job. And if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to worry about. Nobody has anything to hide, right? OK. There are companies that know you hide who you are. You don't give up your data. So they're setting up browser fingerprinting for marketing purposes. This guy, Daniel Norris from Blue Kava, his goal is to fingerprint 10 billion devices. He already has, he already has 200 million devices fingerprinted. You think you're anonymous? You're not anonymous from this weasel. And he really is a weasel. Because this is stuff being done without your knowledge, without your permission. That's un-American. If you're stupid enough not to read your terms of service, it's on you. If you're stupid enough to post a drunken Cancun photo, it's on you. That, that's just weaselly. That's weaselly. That's on America. And while I'm delighted by it as an investigator, as an American, I'm not real fond of it. Cookies, browsing history, download history, embedded graphics tracking your ass everywhere, these little micro pages, passwords appearing in URL strings. Um, 
you type the wrong page and put in your password and hit click and the page doesn't exist anymore, your DNS server will say, no such page, but it'll buffer that page to a file. So Verizon will have it, or Sprint, or, or uh, whatever horrible cable company you're using. Companies like Form, Form doesn't exist anymore. The uproar was too much, but there are many Form-like companies who are smart enough to keep a low profile. DNS corrections, even routers. Cisco, three weeks ago, got spanked because they were sucking down everybody's Net history through their router. Flash cookies, man, flash cookies are unbelievable. They hide here, they hide there, they disguise themselves. They are worse than any Trojan. You can't go to where normal cookies are. You can't go to your preference file on a Mac, by the way, drag that stuff in the settings file to the trash every couple of weeks and, and solve it that way. They just respawn, they respawn. And by the way, they hide the history that they report they hide it in a remote location on your drive so that when they respawn, they're able to say, yep, still the same guy. Now, forensic linguistics. This is an amazing freaking thing. This is one of the most fascinating forensic developments, in my opinion, since DNA, and it makes all you guys sitting ducks on the net. Even if you use Tor, even if you use a strange computer, even if you go to a library, even if you wear a ski mask uh, while you're at the library, <laughs> um, which I've seen some pictures of guys doing stuff at the library, they, they need to. I go on Reddit from time to time. <laughs> Here's a guy, this guy's an assistant US attorney. He's a federal prosecutor. His name is Sal Perricone. He was involved in a case. He was so excised by the people on the other side, the defendants and the potential defendants and the witnesses, he put up a blog and he was anonymously posting all kinds of shit about these people, which is a big no-no if you're the prosecutor. But he was doing it under the alias H.L. Mencken, Henry L. Mencken, 1951. Um, so the people who were on the receiving end of this uh, anonymous, nasty, genuinely legally improper postings, hired a forensic linguistics expert. And they were able to determine some really, really unique words, like doobity. Doobity is the act of being dubious about something. You ever hear that word? I never heard that word. But these posts all had the word doobity. In the entire planet, there's one guy who all of his pleadings, public pleadings filed in court over the years have used the word doobity. There's another one, hold on. Another really, really ridiculous word. Uh, oh, um, here it is. Oh, redoubt, spelled R-E-D-O-U-B-T, like I doubted it again. I redoubted it. Nobody uses these two words. So they had this forensic linguistics guy who's a retired FBI agent who was doing this for the FBI and he was involved in tracking down the Unabomber and people who send ransom notes and stuff like that. And he said, same guy, nobody else uses these words. So they got a subpoena. And before they could use the subpoena to see where the logins were coming from, Mr. so-called H.L. Mencken, Perricone, the prosecutor says, okay, you got me. And by the way, he is obviously no longer on the case. I think he is, and by the way, here's the Times-Picayune article. It's a Fascinating story, Sal Perricone. Google it, read about it. It's the perfect example of, of forensic linguistics. If I have a big enough sample of your writing, there are really, really unique things about everybody's combination of words, commonly used phrases, punctuation. I, I did a case with a, a woman from the New York Times where she was going after a crooked person, and she started getting all kinds of threats that were written by one guy, and she was communicating with another guy. And she noticed that both of these people would do parentheses, space, period in their punctuation. And she was able to figure out it was the same guy and bust them and so on and so forth. Forensic linguistics makes it really impossible for you to hide. If there's a big enough sample of your legitimate writings and even you with the nose and glasses, I can connect that to all your anonymous posts too. Forensic linguistics. 
photos. Photos. If I know that you've posted an anonymous photo on the web, I get your EXIF tags from those anonymous photos. I search on the web for those EXIF tags, and I find Bob Jones is using a camera with the exact same unique serial number, electronic serial number on the camera. I know that those anonymous photos of him, you know, spanking a naked girl in Cancun or whatever, that the, or worse, or worse, it's a good way to catch child molesters and pedophiles. Uh, every digital device has a unique fingerprint now, and I can, anything that you post on the net, not just your words, but your photos and your video and your, and your MP3 files and everything, I can trace back to you by just comparison of digital data. It is harder and harder and harder to, harder to hide. Now, by the way, when you convert a photo, click the box that says, do not embed EXIF data if you are, in fact, an evil criminal. Little <laughs> tip to you, which thank God you will not listen to. And there are, there are web, is so freaking easy to do now, not just for guys like me or the NSA, that there's commercial services out there that let you do it for free, like Google Photo Search and TinEye and what have you. <laughs> Camera noise signatures. Just, even if the EXIF tag isn't in there, every camera sensor has a unique signature, like ballistics on a firearm. You shoot a bullet, the, the scratches on the barrel are unique to each gun. You can match bullets from this photo fire, this bullet fired, this bullet fired. If you have one camera's, one photo's digital noise signature and another's, you can de-anonymize the photo. Just letting you know, just letting you know. Now, here's an example of the digital hive mind. Um, just show of hands how many people know what this photo is. Okay, the whole room, because you're reasonably intelligent people, unlike the usual groups I talk to. I'm going to be in trouble for having said that, aren't I? Um, my boss in the Society of Professional Investigators, not in business, but in the association. He will rat me out later. Uh, this is, of course, the photo, the actual White House official photo of, of uh, everybody waiting for you know, tango down Geronimo, uh, Osama bin Weasel killed. Osama bin killed, or whatever. Um, so, the next day, a story is written on the AP. And it says, on the AP wire, hidden from view, standing just outside the frame, just outside the frame, of that now famous photograph was a career CIA analyst in the hunt for the world's most wanted terrorist, there may have been no one more important. And it's from an article called The Man Who Hunted Osama Bin Laden. So, of course, all the guys on Reddit and Cryptome and Crypt, uh, crypt Everything said, got together, the hive mind started buzzing and said, <laughs> anonymous my ass. So, what can you deduce from the guy? You can tell he's really freaking tall, freakishly tall, and he's wearing a tie and a suit. So he's blocked out of this photo, but through the brilliance of defense intelligence agency counter security guys who were responsible for this particular moment, he's not crapped out of any of the other photos. It took two hours to identify this guy. Two, count him, two hours. So we've got tall, black tie, black suit, yellow tie. Here is the head of the CIA. In the back, very tall guy, Black suit, yellow tie. By the way, I downloaded all of this from the sites to be able to show you this. So you zoom in, and there he is again. Okay, now you've got his photo. So then, here's the situation room. Gee, here's a thought. Let's look at this from another angle. And if you zoom in, see in the corner there, there he is again. <laughs> I mean, come on. And he's identified, and then he's later matched to his college yearbook photo, and here he is playing basketball, and his high school yearbook photo. I forget his name, I normally have it. Not real hard to find, you can Google it. But here is the most wanted guy by the terrorists, super secret, kept from everybody, CIA protected guy, freaking Reddit found him in two hours. Yeah, yeah. And, and you guys, CIA guarded analyst, you. You got a real chance of being anonymous. 
Now, by the way, I just put this up there because I'm an idiot and this made me laugh. And that's how I include things on these things. What makes me laugh? So this girl did, you know, they have these uh, AMA things, uh, ask me anything on Reddit. So she posts, I had breast reduction surgery 24 hours ago. Ask me anything. I'm 18, year okay, now, I'm, eight, I'm an 18 year old girl. I was a 34, a 36, no, 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 now she's a, hold on. A th she was a 32G, now she's a 34C. 18 year old 34C girl who has posted topless photos of herself with the head cut off. And she says, but I want to keep myself anonymous. Okay, 50 minutes, 50 minutes after she posted, edit. Seems like 4chan has come up with my personal information. <laughs> come on, 18 year old topless girl, they're not gonna figure out who she is. I, I mean, there were probably 40,000 analysts working on this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable. You're not, to forget it. You're not anonymous. You know how you stay anonymous? Don't say, I'm anonymous. The minute you say that, you are so screwed. <laughs> and there are identity companies, gig your simplified ping identity, whose job it is to suck down all of your public data, not just stuff like public record data, like VOTA and, 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 uh, and real property and social security information or phone and whatever, but they grab your Facebook and your Twitter and your Google file. And once they grab that, they sell it to Fox and Frito-Lay and Nike and Sona. And they turn around and they give you alternative logins, which you go, yeah, that's convenient. No, it's not. You need to have a separate password for every site. Don't believe me, ask the owners of Stratfor if that's true or not, right? <laughs> Listen. If you log into every site with your Facebook login, A, the people who have your Facebook login have your login to every site, and B, Facebook has all of your login information. I mean, how hard is that to figure out? Apparently, really, really hard. And, guys, so you're secretive. You're good little hackers, you're good little investigators, and by the way, there's about 75 of my colleagues in this room who came, we put out a big posting, you know, come, we're gonna give you continuing education credits for this. Um, later, I'm gonna blow a whistle and this side of the room will collar that side of the room. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, this is something that every investigator has internalized, and so should you. If you don't post your shit, somebody else will. Because they think they're being nice. Hey, this is me and Bob at a party. You didn't, Bob didn't want to post that. Eh, too late. You know, there's sites. Here's two. Again, it made me laugh. I put it up. Here's two sites. Don't date him, girl, and who's a rat? I show this every year. There's a site. Don't date him, girl. Alleged cheater Aaron Carter III. This boy will use you like no other. He smokes weed all day, every day. And if he doesn't have it, he will freak out. Here's his age, his height, his weight, where he lives, his photo. I don't care if Aaron Carter is a ghost. I got him, thanks to a pissed off girlfriend. Oh, this is my favorite one. Jonathan John Rainwater. <laughs> this man, or so-called boy, is such a liar. First he said, uh, first he said he loved me and we were together for four years, and then I catch him in bed, okay, problem number one, with another guy. Problem number two, with another guy, comma, Devin Pridemore. <laughs> so for an investigator, this is kind of a twofer. <laughs> and you've got the Bad Boyfriends Club, and you've got Who's a Rat, where they post informants and information on people. I mean, this is the original doxing site and the original dorking site, and they put up photos and dates of birth and addresses and schools and whatever of informants. It's a terrible, terrible site. Um, and one in five Americans now has a personal blog. They have nothing to say. They have <laughs> shitty, boring little lives. So you know what happens? They write about your life. 
Thank you. I appreciate it. Not how you should manage your privacy. So then you have commercial data gatherers. Think about what using Amazon tells people. And I got to really speed up. What you read, what you like, where you live, your bank account, your credit card, your address, because they actually have to send you stuff. So it's your real address. Your entire profile. Quick example. I had a woman in my building where I live ask me to buy her a book. She ha doesn't have the internet, old Russian woman. Told me in bro broken English, buy me this book on kidney cancer. I bought her the book on Amazon. Four weeks later, I started receiving other things you might be interested in and little things in my mail about cancer. I don't have cancer, thank God. But that's how it works. Kindle and ebook, invasion of privacy like you can't imagine. Kindle even knows what you highlight and what page you stopped reading on. I'm not kidding. If you highlight something because it interests you, the mothership gets a message. Honestly. And by the way, booksellers can have as an extra added thing, nonfiction books, fiction books, will be told by Amazon, 14,000 of the readers highlighted this passage. They really were interested in that. eBay and PayPal, come on. I mean, what do eBay and PayPal, which are the same company, of course, not know about you? Every freaking silly thing you browse on. You browse about helicopters. I mean, okay, bank accounts. I want to know your bank account, not a problem. When you open up a new bank account, in front of every desk of the new accounts officer is a thing that says, little, little sign that says, be advised, your bank account is verified through Equifax Identity Services. Okay, so I go to Equifax Identity Services, I pull your file, and I see that Bank of America did a check on you. I'm going with my turnover order, my seizure order to Bank of America, you know, give me all bank accounts, all investment accounts, anything that this guy's a signatory on, freezes safe deposit boxes ever. They rat you out. They run you, that can only mean one thing. It's not that you walked in and you asked for change of 100, right? Every little thing you do is in a database somewhere. For example, you go to a bar, they take your driver's license now as proof that you gave them an ID that shows that you're of an age to drink. And then that data goes into a database. So, Rambam's first law. Write this down, there will be a test. All databases will eventually be used for unintended purposes. Example, here's a USA Today story. Domino's denies this, Domino's can bite me. USA Today story, how Domino's database, you call Domino's, they deliver you a pizza. I know what your cell phone number is. I go to the Domino's database, and you are a 24-year-old person. Sooner or later, you're going to order Domino's or Papa John's or Papa John's, one or the other. And I know that that cell phone had pizza delivered to 123 Main Street. I got gotcha. you. U.S. Marshal Service, collection agencies, credit bureaus, everybody uses that service. All database. Here's an example from a real case of when I did it. I found out where he bought the pizza. I went to the Papa John's. This is a, yeah, this is Papa John's. I went to Papa John's and they printed out the receipt and it told me right where he went. I went there, grabbed the kid that had been abducted. Now, by the way, why are America's asses growing? Here's why. You don't even get off the couch anymore to go to the phone to order a pizza. You can do it right from your freaking TiVo. I mean, which, by the way, goes into a database, and then I know what IP address you were connected to when you ordered that pizza, and I trace the IP, and I got you. Papa John, from your PlayStation. Papa John's, from your PS3. Okay, points of purchase. You use these cards. Hey, if you've got a, um, somebody give me a New York, uh, a Woolbaums. Use a Wallbaum's frequent idiot card. You get a half off this loaf of bread and three, three cents off of this and 40 cents off of this. I have your entire buying history. What does this tell me about you? It tells me enough that there was a, uh, a chain called Stop and Shop where they tried to sell your buying history to HMOs. 
How much beer are you buying? How much fatty food are you buying? How much cigarettes are you buying? There was such an uproar, they couldn't do it. But obnoxiously, and they were shameless about it, they called this reporting service that they were gonna to sell to the HMOs, smart mouth. Trackers, 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 baby. Trackers, the holy grail of investigators. Finding you, where are you now? Where were you last week? Who were you there with? Who are your friends? A million ways to do it. Now this is old school. Windows, every time you use Windows, it reports back to the mothership. Is this an authorized copy? In addition to reporting whether or not it's an authorized copy, it says Bob's copy connected through this IP address. Apple Store and iTunes, Windows Media Player. Every time you log in anywhere, I know where you are. Internet Explorer, other browsers. Activated software, phones, home. You use Microsoft Word, it connects to the mothership every time you open it up. Even we, even we, connects to the Wii server. TiVo, TV, cable, reports your activity, what you're watching, what you're doing. OnStar, now by the way, OnStar can now be turned on with a warrant and the microphone, even if you don't have OnStar, they can activate it remotely, activate the microphone remotely, and bug your car if there's a warrant. Just letting you know, rip out that microphone. Easy Pass, I Pass, Sun Pass, Metro Card, Passenger List, Car Chip Records, Digital License Plate Readers, big, big, big deal. Unique serial numbers, CD and DVD burner signatures, GPS satellites, the new ones, the Galileo satellites that are gonna be used by the European countries, reports your location within six freaking inches. I can tell not just what side of the street you're on, but what chair you're sitting in at a table. That's literally true, literally true. Check-ins. Check-ins are the investigator's best friend. I feel very comfortable telling you about this because you're nuts, you're not gonna stop. I'm at Bob's Pizzeria. I'm at the movie theater. I'm at the 7-Eleven. Who cares? Now, I care, especially if I'm trying to find out how you spend your day and where I can go grab you and pick up surveillance on you because I lost you when you ran that yellow light. Well, I do, oh, check in, thank you very much. And I go over there and I got you. Why, why? Do you really think that your friends are watching your feed and going, hey, Bob's over there, let me go hang out with him. Are you that freaking lonely? You wanna see your friends say, hey, Bob, let's get a slice of pizza. Check-ins, really? You wanna be the mayor of a bowling alley? <laughs> I mean, how sad is that? How many people in here, suck it up and tell me, how many people in here have been a mayor of somewhere? Yeah, hands are going up, shame on you. You look like a really nice person, I would spend time with you. Don't do that stuff. Mayor, what were you the mayor of? You're not gonna tell me, are you? No, she's shaking her head, no. Okay, well, if you're not gonna tell me, don't do it again and you're forgiven. <laughs> cell phones, cell phones, cell phones, cell phones, cell phones. Listen, last year, according to some information just obtained, 2011, 1.3 million, 1.3 million law enforcement requests for cell phone data. This is not wiretaps, not wiretaps. I can promise you there are not 1.3 million wiretaps. Not even, not even in the book 1984 would there be 1.3 million wiretaps. This is mostly location data. Where's this guy, who's he with? Where's this guy, who's he with? Where was he last month before we knew enough to put a guy on him? Retroactive surveillance. Ah, dude. Cell phones. I can follow you through GPS. I can follow you through Skyhook. I can follow you through enhanced Skyhook, which is what they're calling P2P. I can follow you through pinging. I can follow you through setting up a trigger fish. E911 constantly goes back and forth. Wi-Fi activity from your phone, smartphone activity. All of these things tell me exactly where you are, exactly. And I wanna tell you the phone companies keep tower information and keep location information 
for between 18 months and seven years, depending on the character, uh, uh, carrier. If I want to know everywhere you were, every minute of your life last year, before I even knew I cared about you, before I even knew your name, subpoena, warrant, grand jury subpoena. I know everywhere you were, your entire life. Show of hands. I already know the stats on this, and I'll tell you after I demonstrate it. How many people in this room never, never turn off their cell phone? Okay, look around. It's more than half of the room. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. More than half of the room. 77% of all Americans never turn off their cell phone. They plug it in to charge it, they take it with them. Plug it in to charge it, they take it with them. Holy crap. You never turn off your cell phone. What do you think you're gonna miss at three o'clock in the morning? A ping from Jesus? I mean, <laughs> and I'm Jewish and I say that. Skyhook, if GPS doesn't work, Skyhook has 55 million data points where it knows if you're 200 meters from this location, 400 meters from this location, you're there. Google has a similar product and they're doing this P2P stuff now. I gotta start doing this like a speed freak. If I know where you are, I know what you're doing because every bar, every store, every house, everything is GPS coded. I can look at your GPS location and I can say, you're in front of Twinkie's Boom Boom Room, you're at the movie theater, you are at an abortion clinic, you are at a demonstration in Zuccotti Park, you are at the gun range, <laughs> whatever. I know what's there, because every location is geocoded. Here's your GPS. You press the button, find me the nearest gas station. How do you think it knows that? You think it starts calling around on the phone? It's got everything located in there. So I know parking lot, movie theater, bar, Bob's house, everything. Behavior patterns, associates. If you're going to a bar every night of the week, hey, dude, it tells me something about you. If you're going to a doctor every week, I know you have a medical problem or you're taking someone who does, and I can check to see, is another cell phone going with you? It's that advanced. There's a product called Rabbi that a friend of mine in Israel developed, and he's twisted guys. So he called it Rabbi, which stands for... Um, Okay, where, where is it? Somewhere? Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> I need an assistant, apparently. Relationship and activity analysis and behavior informant. Rabbi. By looking at what you've done and who you've done it with, I can tell who you're meeting with, who's important to you. I can see if you are a known associate of criminals. I can tell what results from your activities. I'm not going to go through this because the clock is ticking. But it tells me, now by the way, here is from an actual subpoena, here's a cell tower response. It tells me down to 25 feet, if you look at that, where you are. Sometimes it tells me you're on the spot. And again, Google P2P, Google P2P. This is gonna be a game changer. This and the new GPS satellites and everybody using smartphones. Here's a, here's, uh, um, this is sold to private industry. Now. I'm not gonna get up here. I'll, I'll be very upfront about you, uh, about this. I'm not telling you the best stuff I know for two reasons. First of all, the publicly available stuff is freaky enough. And I'm, I believe, making my point. And second of all, of course, there are bad people out there that this stuff does deserve to be targeted at. And it's not my place. I'm not Julian Assange, who we could talk about some other time. Uh, I don't believe in what Julian Assange is doing. I believe in freedom of information, that's for damn sure. But I don't believe that I have a right to take secret information or law enforcement information and decide myself who gets what. So I don't discuss that. I think that's wrong. I think it's bad. By the way, I do think Julian Assange raped those two women, so that puts him on my shit list too. Um, but this is an example of what's out there that's used by law enforcement. Not only does it suck in everything, your IP contacts, your email, your profile, 
your social networking contacts, but it builds a profile of you. And it can follow if it knows you're using two or three phones that identifies. Listen, you have a regular phone and you have a drop phone. Everywhere your regular phone is, including three o'clock in the morning, your drop phone is. Gee, is it possible Bob is using a second phone I don't know about? Come on. So this analyzes that, it finds that second phone, and it, and it grabs the data. And it can grab the data after the fact. And here, multiple handphones, multiple SIMs, locations, whatever. The funny thing is, the US government gives this stuff out, and in the case of Milan, it was turned against them. Historic data. I'm going to keep zipping through this, but let me just tell you, I can find out without breaking a sweat, everywhere you go, everybody you spend time with, everything you like to do, everywhere you do it, and who you do it with, just from your cell phone. Okay? I don't have to show you a whole lot of slides. That's the bottom line. And I'm, here's, here, by the way, here's one of the programs being tested where it reports locations and SIM cards and activities and everything. The beta test name of the program is, honest to God, guilt by association. And here's link analysis. Here is a criminal conspiracy. You know, who are the central guys? We know that that guy's a bad guy, main bad guy, everybody goes to him, and so on and so forth. Guys, I'm not telling you anything you couldn't find out if you cared to do so by just going on Google. A lot of these examples, because I knew what to look for, I went, I went right to the company's websites, I went right to Google, I sucked this all down. None of this is a secret. Now, I'm gonna do this really, really fast. Um, Milan. There's an example that I give in Mil about Milan. <coughs> there was a terrorist, Omar Abu Bakr. Alleged terrorist, real terrorist, we're not gonna get into that. CIA thought he was a terrorist. So they sent 26 guys to Milan and they snatched him up. And they did what's called an extraordinary rendition, which is a euphemism for putting a bag over his head, taping him up, and shipping him to a country where we won't torture him, but they will. And in this case, they shipped him to Egypt, where he was tortured horribly, uh, homosexual rape, beatings, burnings, whatever, for a few years. There's actually a book on it, a really, really good one, not an opinionated left-wing book, a book that even I think is good, called uh, A Kidnapping in Milan, which I urge you to read. Um, and then after three years of being tortured, both the Egyptians and the CIA agents who were observing the torture for a good part of it said, uh, oops. And they put him back on a plane and they put him back to Milan, um, where the prosecutor, who's a pretty good guy, pretty good cop, uh, anti-mafia prosecutor by the name of uh, Bruno Megali, says, we have to identify these guys. So here's what he did. That, by the way, is from an actual surveillance. That's Omar Abu Bakr, who kind of looks like somebody I'd want to rendition if I was in that frame of mind. Uh, don't judge people by their looks. So here's what happened. They figured out where he was kidnapped. They knew where he was kidnapped because there were two witnesses to the kidnapping who went to the police. So they went to the cell towers using information, by the way, that had been given to them by the CIA for anti-terrorism work. And they grabbed all of the connections. Now, for those of you who are tech weenies or phone weenies or phone freaks, as Captain Crunch in the room, for example, you know that a GSM cell phone has two things. It has a hardwired code, which is randomly called either an ESN or an MEID or an IMEI, depending on who you're asking. And it has a SIM card. Both of these things are absolutely unique. No phone has that hardware ID. No phone has that SIM card ID. And together, they are super, super unique. So they went and they identified all the SIM cards and all the hardware IDs in the location. And they found people who met a certain profile. They weren't in the area normally. They didn't live in the area. Their SIM numbers and their IMEI and whatever weren't there at night. They did the most basic analysis. And I want to tell you, 
The key question for an analyst to ask is, what does X look like? What does a terrorist look like? What does a kidnapper look like? What does a money launderer look like? And once you figure out the profile, then you go out to big data, to the data sets, and you find everything that matches that. And more often than not, you're right. More often than not, you're right. If I want to find a drug dealer, if I want to find a money launderer, today, if I have the right analyst and the right general profile, I can find drug dealers, I can find money launderers, I can find terrorists just by pressing a button. There is enough data now. So they said, what would the kidnappers look like? Well, they would look like people who um, were in the area at the time of the kidnapping. Then, checking back, we would see that they were there intermittently. We would also see that they came together, meaning four-man team does the snatch, four-man team does the recon in advance, so on and so forth. They knew what to look for. Somebody whose SIM card is there all day because they're running a store or working in the hotel. By the way, the best tower that they used was on the roof of the Hilton Hotel there. Uh, the profile, the profile was X. They figured out the profile and they found three, four, five, six groups of cell phones. One of the cell phones they knew because this anti-terrorism prosecutor was talking to the owner of that cell phone on a regular basis. He was the CIA station chief. So they went, aha. And things started falling apart from there. 11 SIMs were in the snatch location, were in contact with six SIMs at a blocking location on the A4. Another three SIMs were shared SIMs. In the months before the abduction, 20 SIMs had been in regular frequent contact with the other. They were able to discern patterns. Here is, by the way, I went and I actually got copies of the court file. Here is an actual thing from the court file. These are people talking to other people in the target SIMs. And they were able to track these SIMs extrapolating out from known people, including Bob Lady, the CIA station chief. And they were able to identify, for example, three other people. Now, it gets worse, by the way. After the kidnapping, the snatch team and the blocking team dispersed. They dispersed by getting together at the same hotels, by checking in using credit cards that were all billed to the same P.O. box where? Correct. Gets worse. The credit cards, the first 13 digits of the credit cards were? Sequential. Causes me pain as an investigator. So eventually, they were able to build these profiles. They were able to identify everybody. This one goes to this hotel, the Hilton, talks to that cell phone. And by the way, they found out that a bunch of the CIA teams were shacking up. This girl ended up checking in with this guy and so on and so forth, which busted up two marriages, by the way, when the indictment came out. No, no, that's really true. Read the book. Really fascinating. And they were able to ultimately, that's the indictment. 20, it's not Bravo, it's what a goddamn shame because these are, for the most part, I've looked into the background of these people, these are people who are real good Americans, real patriots, join the CIA, you don't get paid real well in the CIA, I can tell you that if you work for the government, you work for private sector, I get paid five times what these guys do and they work 87 times harder than I do and they're in 97 times as much danger as I am. And they're mostly doing it for America, not because they can't get a private sector job. If they want to go and become what's called red cards, they get five times as much money. I mean, literally five times as much money. Um, these, are, these are good people. It's not Bravo. Say what? They were just following orders. Kiss my ass. <laughs> these are not Nazis. I know some of these people. You don't. They were foolish, but they are not Nazis. By the way, I'm the only one in this room who actually was a Nazi hunter and caught Nazis. Don't tell me about Nazis. Okay? Um, unfortunately, these 26 people were caught, and it was done entirely through electronic means. If this can be done to these guys, imagine your daily life. 
And people do it not because they want to invade your privacy, they want to sell you stuff. Things are to the point now where you are walking down the aisle, you stop in a supermarket and you look at a display of canned peaches. On your phone will pop up a coupon for a certain brand of canned peaches to try to get you to buy those peaches. And if you in fact do buy those peaches, which will be confirmed because you're going to probably be using your cell phone as the payment device, but for now you're using your credit card as the payment device, Apple gets a credit or Android slash Google gets a credit or AdMob gets a credit. You're walking into a steakhouse. On your phone pops up, stop. Don't go into Bob's Steakhouse. Here's 33% off for Fred's Steakhouse. Back out of there, go two blocks to the right. 33% off. That is coming, has come, will be coming more and more and more. It's not because they want to invade your privacy. They want to sell you stuff. And so it's so intensely accurate and intensely all-inclusive that these private companies, which by the way, you have no control over, no control whatsoever. Let me tell you a story. There is a drug dealer, a bona fide bad man drug dealer, who was caught in large part because the FBI put a bumper beeper, a GPS tracking device on his car. So his attorney argues all the way up to the Supreme Court, this is an invasion of privacy, they should have had a warrant. Supreme Court agrees. This guy's conviction is thrown out. He has to be retried. Um, FBI said, no problem. We'll just use his GPS data from his phones. Same exact evidence, even more detailed. They got rid of 3,000 GPS bumper beepers, and now they're using 30 million cell phones, or 300 million cell phones. It's not because the FBI wants to track you. It's because people want to sell you stuff. Here is mobile location tracking. I want to tell you this is a commercially available service. This is sold right now to bail bondsmen, to private investigators. If I want your cell phone pinged, hey, I call my office, I speak to Clarissa, I say, Clarissa, listen, I lost this tail. Call blah, 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 I'm not going to tell you the name of the company, but you guys can Google this text and pull it up right off of their website like I did, but it's not my job to tell you. Um, pinging is now a commercial service. I can find out where your cell phone is right now. Ten years ago, maybe the, the NSA could do it. Now, any schmuck with an account can do it, and this is not the only one. And they can track you down to within 15 meters, within 30 seconds, or within 100 meters within 10 seconds. And here, by the way, this is a true story. I was contacted by an investigator in Dallas who said we were hired by a family. Uh, this girl, three nights ago, went out to get pizza for her, uh, for her job crew, uh, went to the pizzeria. They wouldn't take her credit card. She went to a cash machine, took out 100 bucks, we know we've got her uh, ATM card usage and the photo from the cash machine, and she's disappeared. So we pinged her cell phone. This is the actual ping of the cell phone that I did. This is my ping. And we found her car, and they went there, and they found her dead in the car, uh, sadly. She, it was 106 degrees in the car. She had stopped, had a couple of beers in the car, fell asleep in the car, got cooked. And she died, but it would have been days before they found her, and I can't even imagine in a parked car in Dallas where the, uh, the uh, engine had run out of gas and there was no AC, uh, what she would have been like. But we found her, and, and I've used pinging for a lot of cases, and it's an invaluable tool, and anybody can do it. iPhone. Apple iPhone reports every damn thing about you. Who you talk to, where you are, what you buy, who you text, who you email, where you eat, what movies you're interested in, searching for properties, everything. And they're doing it for one reason, I add. This is not Photoshop. I add, iPhone, iPad, I add, I, you're screwed, okay? I mean, Apple say, okay, I was smart enough to put it up there. Just so you know, all your communications with Siri saved. 
Safari lets you strip out ads, but it reports the URLs to Apple. Again, like Google encrypted search, ooh, they're doing you a big favor, stripping out ads. No, no, no. They don't want other people to be able to sell you ads. They want to be able to say to advertisers, anybody using Safari, the only way you can put an ad there is through us. New privacy policy lets Apple collect and share iPhone users' precise locations. Why? Not because, I can't think of the guy's name, whoever it was that took over from Steve Jobs, not because he cares where you are at 3 o'clock in the morning, but because he wants to sell you stuff. Cell phone is a loyalty card, payment device, barcode reader, store guide, eBay or Amazon portal, manufacturer syncing, retail object recognition, Google goggles, all data to manufacture, locator beacon, never turned off. These facts are standard on everybody's phone and it gives me your life. I'm gonna switch through this super fast. Oh, there you go. We're gonna talk now, we're gonna, I mean, I don't, do I really need to cover what GPS does and that it's a constant implementation at everything now? Again, GPS, um, I mean, it's so easy and it's so simple that there's an app that you can put in a bar in Dallas and it will tell, no, excuse me, you can put in a location in Dallas and it will suck down how many girls there are around you and where you can go and stalk them. This has been pulled down. Oh, and this is the USA versus Antoine Jones. Google that, look at it, understand. Now, marketing. Oh boy, I'm running over. I am gonna tell you that, by the way, my favorite one right there is the huge woman with the diaper and the antenna on her head. <laughs> if, you're, if you're just looking for one. I will tell you that every subscription, every 800 number call, every product survey, every product resolution, uh, registration, every credit card usage, every login, every website visit, every check-in, every like, every friend, everything is used to define you down to a unique person and figure out what you'll pay money for. Your likes, your dislikes, your habits, your hobbies, your religion, your politics, your sexual orientation, everything. If I buy, if I subscribe to Wine Spectator, I'm interested in wine. Gun Digest, I'm interested in guns. Hebe, I'm a Jewish guy. Paz, I'm HIV positive. I mean, every little thing about you can be defined down. And they have marketing lists that they sell. I mean, I wish I could go into this a little more. I gotta do this like a speed freak now. But there are primarily two companies, InfoUSA and Axiom, A-C-X-I-O-M, that have billions of records, tens of billions of records on you. Your age, your income level, home value, your health, your hobbies, your ethnicity, the value of your home, your, your household income, your date of birth, your discretionary spending. And they sell marketing lists, suffering seniors, elderly people with cancer. There's specific marketing to those people. Oldies but goodies, gamblers over the age of 55. Axiom, Axiom pulls together direct mail, calls, networks, websites, emails, displays, your mobile phone activity, your text activity, your social networking activity, everything into one file about you. And they have 132 million unique files on Americans. They pull in how many friends you have, how many sites you visit, Facebook, LinkedIn, MySpace, Twitter followers, social activity segments, like if you like something, how much you spend, your income, your race, your religion. Uh, do you have an allergy? Do you have arthritis? Do you have diabetes? Do you eat organic food? Are you a senior? Are you interested in arts, flying, uh, computers, celebrities? How many kids you have? How old they are? Are you divorced? Are you a newlywed? And so on and so forth. And they put them together in lists. These people know more about you on any given day than the FBI, the CIA, the KGB, your own mother. Uh, you with the glasses. 
If I come to you and I say, I've got a guy I'm investigating. He's a subscriber to Soldier of Fortune magazine, American Rifleman, the Washington Times. He purchased the Force of Reason. He's a registered Republican, and he's listed in Focus USA's Christian donors list, which I can determine about somebody pretty damn easily. What can you tell me about this person? Is that like thing on too tight? I'll tell you what it tells me. He's a, probably, but you know he's a gun owner. He's a right winger. He's, well, that's for damn sure. He's a Republican and he's a believing Christian and he's into Christian politics. Okay. Second guy, Village Voice, High Times Magazine, Cat Fancier, reads Noam Chomsky, Green Party, contributed to the United Jewish Appeal, the gay men's health crisis, by the way, this is a real profile, and American Friends of Peace Now. What do you know about him? He is a left-wing, he is a left-wing, gay, Jewish guy. Probably pot smoker. Left-wing, pot smoking, gay, Jewish guy. Right? Now, by the way, just, 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 was that you? That's you? Now, by the way, I just, I just want to, I'm not gay or left-wing. Um, not, not, not that there's anything wrong with it. I love that line. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Okay, now, by the way, the way that you tell that this guy is gay, just for those of you who want to go into investigations, has nothing to do with the, with the uh, gay men's health crisis. He's single and he lives with a cat. That's all you need to know. <laughs> with databases, 47 times easier. You can download all of this information and get the same thing on your computer almost immediately. Lists, cross-referencing, matching can all be done in one place. I can go, forget about marketing. I can go to your Facebook profile. I can go to your Apple profile. I can go to your MySpace profile. I can go to what Google has on you and determine this right away. Psychographics, micro-targeting, the big sword. I can take stuff and extrapolate out. The one example that I like to give is when VW wanted to introduce the Beetle, it had been out of uh, production for so long that they didn't even have lists of prior owners that were worth a damn. So after the first year, they surveyed like mad. I mean, they're Germans, they're good at it. They surveyed like mad all of the VW owners. And they found every characteristic they could. Are they male, female, white, black, uh, Democrat, Republican, uh, income level, whatever. And they found that people who owned a cat and ate chunky peanut butter were three times as likely to buy a Volkswagen Beetle. So they bought up the peanut butter owner lists and the cat owner lists and they cross-referenced them and they marketed like hell to everybody who showed up on both lists and they sold a ton of Volkswagens. This is not a joke. This is really true. This is a marketing study. For example, last, last election, Rove and all the guys on the Democratic side figured out butter, white wine, Fig Newtons, fruit-filled cookies, Red Lobster, Drive a Volvo, yoga, you are much more inclined to be a Hillary voter. Right on. Yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> and do you fit that profile? No. Well, I don't believe it. Olive oil, bare naked granola, lattes to go, cheesecake factory, Panera and Starbucks, Barack Obama. Bourbon, stuffed crust pizza, fiber one. <laughs> not, not my survey. Hardee's, Fuddruckers, BMW and own a gun. John McCain. And then they would take these lists and they would proselytize to them. It is an amazing, amazing thing. Amazing, amazing thing. Uh, don't have more time. I now want to go to, this is an example of an intrusive profile. I now want to go to cameras. Cameras are really, really important. I'm almost certainly going to run a couple of minutes over, over, but let's try not to. This is this area. Right now, 1998, few cameras. 2003, 2008, today, today there are over 3,000 cameras in the one square mile around Bryant Park. 3,000 cameras. 
the big thing is accuracy and, and, and resolution of the cameras, facial recognition, license plate recognition, and analytics. Analytics is a biggie. Here is Obama's inauguration. Here is Obama's inauguration. Here is Obama's inauguration. That's how close you can get. From that to that, using something called Gigapan. From that, you can get to that, that, or that. I can take a picture of this room, bam, with a high resolution Gigapan camera and have enough to ID everybody in here. Let me give you an example. Watch the bouncing thing. This is called Gigapan. You can go to the website, do this yourself. Gigapan.com. I'm zooming in. Unfortunately, I was doing this on an old slow Mac, so this is going to take a second. I just want you to see that I wasn't making up these, these pictures. Now, by the way, I picked these two guys right here as my final photo, because they look kind of like mafia-ish, right? With the hat and the glasses. I was doing a job with the Secret Service, and he says, what's these photos about? I said, yeah, they look kind of creepy. I wanted to use them for a facial recognition example. He says, they're wearing Congress identification pins. <laughs> so just so you know, these are your representatives. Looking, <laughs> looking, like, looking like Carlo Gambino, right? So just so you know, from that, to that. That's where cameras are at right now. Perfect example is London. 1967, the first camera. 30 years later, there are only 500 cameras. 2008, 4.2 million community safety cameras. It's estimated that you walk down the street in London from point A to point B, no matter what your trip is, you're filmed at least 200 times. Drones. These guys before talked about drones, they don't know the half of it. Anywhere you want a drone, we can have a drone. Helicopter drones. Perpetual drones. Little drones that the police department can throw that they can keep in the trunk of their car. Drones that are cyborgs. That is a real moth. Oh, here we go. Okay, I hope you know what you're doing. No, 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 don't sit here. Don't sit here. Go, go over there and, and fly it around and first make sure you don't kill anyone and then we'll use the video. Cyborg drones. This is a real moth that they've put a controller and a camera on. Devil Ray. When this thing needs to recharge, it throws out two wires, puts it on a high tension wire, sucks it up and flies away again. Uh, experiment over, landed. Well, landed. I don't mind invading your privacy, but I don't want to invade your cranium. <laughs> there are things that you can carry around in a briefcase if you're undercover open it up, prop it up, and it takes off and flies around. No, that's for real. NYPD right now has a camera that's good enough to, from two miles away, so far enough away, you can't even hear the chopper, look inside a car and see what's going on. They used it, there was a hostage standoff, and they didn't know what happened with the guy in the car that had a gun, so they brought out the chopper and they zoomed in on the car, and by the way, at night, they were able to do it, and they saw that the guy had shot himself, so they moved the ESU team, the SWAT team in, and pulled him out of the car, and he was, he was dead. Here's an example. This is just a couple of weeks ago from Israel Hayom paper. Israel is in the forefront of these tiny, tiny little drones, uh, platoon-level drones that they can take out with them. This is designed to look like a bird, so it can be used covertly. There it is right there. There it is, the guy controlling it in flight. By the way, never underestimate stupid paranoia of a Middle Eastern government. The Turks heard about these birds, and they started shooting real birds, migrating from Israel, and checking them for cameras. And this is an actual screenshot from Turkish TV. Sad, I feel sorry for this little birdie, but write your nasty letters to the Turks. 
Disturbing video number one. Micro air vehicles, or MAVs, will play an important role in future warfare. The urban battlefield calls for tools to increase the warfighter's situational awareness and capacity to engage rapidly, precisely, and with minimal collateral damage. MAVs will be integrated into future Air Force layered sensing systems. These systems may be airdropped or hand launched depending on the mission requirements. That's a real unit. I'm going to show you the real unit in a second. That is a real unit. This is the small a size of MAVs allows them to be hidden in plain sight. Once in place, an MAV can enter a low-powered extended surveillance mode for missions lasting days Watch or this. weeks. This may require the MAV to harvest energy from environmental sources, such as sunlight or wind, or from man-made sources, such as power lines and vibrating machinery. Which it will means blend it in with its surroundings forever. and operate undetected. MAVs will use microsensors and microprocessor technology to navigate and track targets through Follows complicated terrain, such as urban areas. An MAV operating in urban terrain will have more agility challenges than larger UAVs. Obstructions can cause wind gusts, even on a calm day. One way to overcome this is to learn from examples in nature and use flapping wings to fly. Sensing an oncoming gust, feedback control directs the wings to flap asymmetrically, compensating for the wind. Small size and agile flight will enable MAVs to covertly enter locations inaccessible by traditional means of aerial surveillance. MAVs will use new forms of navigation, such as a vision-based technique called optic flow. This system remains robust when traditional methods, such as GPS, are unavailable. <laughs> anyway, you get the point. And that is a legitimate thing. Um... This video presents autonomous control. All right, you know what? That's just uh, a drone flying everywhere. Now, by the way, whoever said there's X number of drones has no clue. The U.S. Army is giving away hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of surplus drones to police forces. Police forces are using them everywhere. Texas, I have an office in a home in Texas. Texas even has, Texas police, not the military, even has a drone with a grenade launcher. Uh, this is an unmanned vehicle with Hellfire missiles. This is a commercial drone. For every military or government drone out there, there are somewhere between three to ten commercial drones. This is an actual commercial drone. These are guys using drones as hobbyists. When I was a kid launching rockets, now people are using drones as hobbyists. Here's another guy, a hobbyist. Guy doing a ski jump. This is a Sports Illustrated drone. Sports Illustrated magazine has its own drone to follow performers. That is an actual drone. That is the drone you saw before. That is an actual drone. That is an actual drone. <laughs> okay. There's something called proof of concept. Proving how freaking easy it is for anybody who wants, now I use drones all the time as an investigator now. I'm a private investigator uh, and I use drones. I don't have the NSA's budget. Here's a guy, his cat died. He loved his cat. He loved his cat, he loved drones. So he turned his dead cat into a drone. I'm not making this up. Go to the internet, research it. No Photoshop, no bullshit. A dead cat flying around the street. That's how easy it is. Now, this is just, just the U.S. Air Force. This is their um, uh, 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 declassified, couldn't think of the word for a second. This is the declassified map from the U.S. Air Force. Yeah, now, five minutes left, now you lower the light. This is the declassified map of drone bases in the United States. I just... Is that on purpose? Yeah, give me five more minutes. I mean, I mean, did somebody purposely shut that off?
Why do you care about the time? Because, listen, from here, we're we have an hour downstairs, so I am only going to continue for five more minutes because we have a whole hour in a room downstairs. Uh, it's, it's a, let me just tell you very quickly while they're putting this back on, I am the vice president and educational chairman of the Society of Professional Investigators. This is the president here. In addition to having a Q&A downstairs, I very much am looking to recruit from this group members of the Society of Professional Investigators. If you are an investigator, if you are a law enforcement officer, if you are a security professional, if you are in a forensic field, if you feel that you would fit in in an investigative slash law enforcement organization, we have monthly meetings, uh, dinner meetings. Uh, the membership fees are very, very cheap. I, I feel comfortable telling you about this because, first of all, it's a great group, and I'm not shilling for myself. Uh, if you're interested in this group, come up to us. I would love to get five, ten new members from this group, especially, especially if you are an IT security person and you work with a facility or you work with law enforcement. Uh, if you bridge the gap between what I do and computers, we want you. So come and talk to us in the room. If you have questions you want to ask or you want to talk to me privately or Bruce or whatever, come downstairs also. Now I'm going to do this like a speed freak. I want to show you analytics. Cameras can determine what you're doing. Uh, cameras can determine. Cameras can determine what you're doing, where you're doing it. For example, it knows this person is sitting, this person is eating, this person is playing. The funny thing is, this is a schoolyard, but the product was developed by people for prisons, so it thinks this kid is making a break for it. No, no, that's really true. This is a real ad from Security Magazine. Facial recognition. Every state driver's license uh, repository, Department of Motor Vehicles in New York, DPS in Texas, is taking driver's license photos and comparing them to mugshots. If you come in and you apply for a driver's license and you're a wanted person, you may not make it out of the DMV. I mean, you think DMV is a pain in the ass now. Wait till, uh... Real world. Israel, allegedly, did a hit in Dubai on a Hamas member. They sent a hit team. Dubai, little Dubai, was able to take airport cameras, hotel cameras, grab everybody, and compare them to passport photos. This is the killer. This is the passport photo. Uh, we don't have time for that, but let me tell you that even I have the ability to use facial recognition. It's that simple now. When I was looking to match MySpace pages to sexual predators, I was able to do it. When I was looking to match Illinois deadbeat dad to MySpace and Facebook pages, I was able to do it. Sex offenders, sex offenders. This was the easiest one. This guy had the biggest balls you've ever seen. He used his sexual offender booking photo as his MySpace photo. <laughs> Not making it up. You can look up the, the CNET article when I, when I revealed this. Wearing a disguise doesn't help. Facial recognition on only five, you can enhance a photo now. Facial recognition on only a portion of your face is now possible. Even 5%. Nose analytics. I mean, for me, it should be a cinch. But for everybody, where your nose is on your face, the angle, this, that, it's possible just from a nose to ID somebody. I, I know there's a joke in there somewhere, but whatever. Gate, yeah, this guy. Well, now I understand. Okay, gate recognition, how you walk. If you bebop, it knows that's Bob's bebop. Okay, I'm getting the cut. I just want to go to one thing. No, 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 no.